good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by my speaker, Corey Johnson, and Council Member Redenchik and Powers. Uh, we're here to hold a hearing and a vote on proposed intro number 600-A and proposed reso number 188-A, which adopts the findings of the most recent housing vacancy survey and extends rate st rent stabilization and rent control in New York City. New York City's housing stock is increasingly becoming unaffordable for, those, for the many seniors and families who live here. And the housing vacancy survey shows that it is crucial for us to extend rent regulation for the next three years and for our state counterparts in Albany to do the same when it expires in 2019. I look forward to working with my fellow council members, especially Speaker Johnson and advocates, to ensure that that does happen next year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a card with the sergeant, and we'll be sticking to a three-minute clock for all public testimony except for the speaker. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here to discuss uh, rent regulation, the most critical tool we have for maintaining affordable housing in New York City. This year's housing vacancy survey results are staggering and show that it is, of course, necessary for the city to extend rent regulation. According to the survey, there is only a 3.63% vacancy rate in the city, and when it comes to rent-regulated housing, that vacancy rate drops to 2%. On top of that, three in 10 renter households pay 50% or more of their income towards rent in the city, meaning that these renters are rent burdened, making it difficult to pay bills or raise a family. Even worse, the median rent went up by 6% in the three years since the last survey in 2014. When combined with the lack of available rent-regulated housing, it's apparent from these statistics that this city is becoming increasingly unaffordable. We have lost hundreds of thousands of rent-regulated housing since the mid-1990s. And we cannot lose any more. We cannot risk more families having to choose between paying rent or putting food on the table. At a time when New York City is committed to expanding opportunities and access to affordable housing, and when the city is struggling with a homelessness crisis, the survey shows that we have much more work to do. Throughout this year, and until the state takes up rent regulation in June of 2019, we will be urging the state legislature to, repeals law, to repeal laws that are making housing unaffordable, such as vacancy decontrol, the preferential rent loophole, and vacancy bonuses. We will continue to work on legislation that protects tenants, and we will continue to increase opportunities to access affordable housing. Today, we are taking the first step by renewing the findings that we are still in a housing crisis so that the state can extend rent regulation for another three years. I want to thank our chair of this Housing and Buildings Committee, my friend, Councilman Robert Cornegy, for having me here today. And I want to thank you, all the tenants and organizers in this room. I see so many friends when I walk around, Dulcinea and Michael and uh, so many folks that are here that I've been in the trenches with over the years. And I hope to see you again in the coming months as we advocate for rent reform. I I'll end with this. There was a press conference this morning with uh, Councilmember Torres related to Jared Kushner uh, illegally trying to drive people out of rent-regulated buildings in his buildings throughout the city. And we have to ensure that the things that are within our power in the city, DOB ensuring that landlords are not able to engage in uh, construction, which drives people out of their buildings, we are going to continue to play that oversight role uh, we want to strengthen the rent laws uh, and continue to work on behalf of tenants here in New York City where it makes sense for them. So again, I want to thank you, Councilmember Cornegy, and I look forward to hearing from all of you and working with all of you in the months to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are going to begin the opening testimony with um, a panel of tenants and tenant advocates first. We really believe that it is important sometimes to hear directly from the voices prior to the administration. So in this hearing today, uh, prior to the administration giving testimony, we will be hearing from uh, Reverend, Reverend Leslie Foltz Morrison, Basilio Garcia, and Vaughn Armour.
drink. I'd like to affirm your testimony here before City Council. Oh, never mind. You can begin. We, we generally ask ladies first. Yeah, but I'm, I'm unfortunate I have to run. And I asked them. Oh, okay. Yes, Neil Worked it out already? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Hi, my name is Vaughn Armour, and I'm the president of Barber Simmons Tenor Association and a proud member of New York Community for Change. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. I'm here, I'm here because of, of two years ago, my companion, of 17 years passed away. The very next day, the landlord called me and asked me what I'm gonna do about the apartment. He didn't call to say, you have my condolences or to see how I feel, how I felt. All he wanted to, all he wanted to is to to uh, question us about the stabilization and lie to us about it, where he can get the apartment and raise the rent. And that's totally disrespectful. And this is what's going on in Crown Heights and throughout the city. Uh, in my 560 and 570 was taken over by Tree top developers, developers. They came in, they beautified the outside, they they fixed the lobby, and they fixed the hall, the stairwells and hallways. They did this for attract newcomers. In the meanwhile, tenants like me that have been there for 17, and tenants that have been in the building for 20 and 30 years, are going through lack of repairs, um, lack of heat. And this is what we're facing right now. Uh, and also, um, what they want is to push out long-time residents that have been in the building where they can uh, put in new tenants and get market value. I'm here also to ask that we the council of the city declare a housing emergency where where we can uh, uh, open we can get the governor Cuomo I'm of course named Governor Cuomo and the uh, state senators especially the IDC members to strengthen our, uh, uh, swift in the rent laws and uh, not, no, I'm sorry, not only swift in the rent laws, but to protect us tenants by getting rid of, getting rid of such as um, the rent vacancy bonus, the vacancy bonus and preferential rent. And this is, this, was, this is a must. This, this is definitely a must. And, I, and I'm telling you, I see my longtime neighbors being forced out, especially what, what's going on in the buildings where I live at. So once again, I want to uh, make it clear that right now where I live at in Crown Heights, we go into what we, I call a super gentrification process. So I once again say um, thank you for the opportunity and please, please help us stay in our community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony.
while I understand that we are all very passionate about affordability and staying in our communities, I have to ask you not to clap out loud. Generally, um, when we want to express, thank you. Oh, you guys already knew. Thank you. Next. All right. I hope you can hear me better now. Uh, greetings, Chairperson Cornegy and uh, Council uh, President uh, Mr. Johnson, or Council Speaker. Uh, my name is Leslie Foltz Morrison, I, uh, Reverend Leslie Foltz Morrison. I live in the Bronx in a rent stabilized building and I am here as a member of the Met Council on Housing in support of Resolution 188A and Intro 600A. And I am so pleased to hear that you sound sympathetic and supportive of these bills. I thank you and all the members of, of the City Council and the, all your staff members who serve pub, for, in public service on behalf of all New Yorkers, and that you seem to be so concerned about renters that they can stay in their apartments and avoid eviction and homelessness. I'm especially concerned about the need to repeal the statutory vacancy bonus, which allows landlords to raise a rent-stabilized apartment by 20% when a unit is vacated. I have seen in my building in Kingsbridge, my landlord has been tempted to take advantage of this loophole these past couple of months after a pipe burst and flooded three apartments. My neighbors in these units, two of them are families with young children, were moved from their flooded two-bedroom apartments into studio apartments in the building, but their rent was not reduced. And all this time, the repairs on their units that they want to move back into, repairs have not even begun. And so I can see that with this statutory vacancy loophole, that the landlord has a strong incentive to drag out these repairs and uh, to the units that the tenants want to move back into. And then they will give up and move out. And so the landlord can then jack up the rent for the next set of tenants, while perhaps not even disclosing that the units had been water damaged. So it is no wonder why New York City rents are so high with these um, loophole per, uh, permitted. In the face of our city's housing crisis, I think it is essential that we protect all the affordable units that we do have and the families who depend on them. It was 30 years ago this month when the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference issued a moral challenge for us to view adequate housing as a human right. And it is now harder, much harder than it was 30 years ago to advocate for this with the commonly accepted practice of real estate investment trust where they see every apartment as an opportunity to put profit over people. And so you have this important opportunity to act to protect sta rent stabilized. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Garcia. Hello, uh, my name is Basilio Garcia. Good afternoon, festival. I am a tenant, a president of my tenant association from Queens and a member of Woodside on the Move. I am standing here today to call for a stronger rent loss. We cannot receive more increases. What we need desperately is to preserve affordable housing. I live in a building that every year has been affected by MCI systematically. The landlord has been applying for MCI to increase the legal rent. This year, for example, we have a MCI approved and there will be increase for, of $30 per room. I have three rooms and it's due to the math. I will be writing a separate check for $90. This increase is not increased. It will be an addition order. I live on the district of General Peralta, and the community need their elected official to advocate and represent them. 
uh, we work in class 10 and cannot afford another increase. It is injustice that the landlord receive. They get an additional increase to the legal rent. We demand a stronger protection for tenants, or otherwise we'll be killing the affordable housing. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you so much for all of your testimonies. Are there any questions? Thank you. At this time, we'll ask the administration. Also, I want to point out we've been joined by Council Members Chin, Jonai, Williams, Rosenthal, Torres, and Espinal. At this point, if I can just affirm your testimonies, I can have you raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? Yes. Thank you. I'd like for you to begin. By identifying yourselves, please. Uh, my name is Matt Murphy. I'm Deputy Commissioner of Policy and Strategy at HBD. My name is Francesc Marti. I'm Assistant Commissioner for Government Affairs at HPD. Elizabeth Gomer, Assistant Commissioner for Research and Evaluation, HPD. Thank you for joining us. You can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cornegy and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I am Matt Murphy, Deputy Commissioner of Policy and Strategy at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I'm joined by my colleagues, Elizabeth Gomer, Assistant Commissioner of Research and Evaluation, and Francesc Marti, Assistant Commissioner of Government Affairs. I would like to thank the committee for welcoming us today to discuss rent regulation, a vital topic that fundamentally concerns the future of New York City. New York City continues to face a housing affordability crisis that causes too many of our residents to pay a larger share of income for housing than they can sustain. This day-to-day -day reality forces many to make strategic trade-offs, to delay payment of other critical expenses, go into debt, or fall short on paying the rent, which we know places them at a greater risk of eviction and, in more dire situations, homelessness. This is a crisis that requires action at every level of government. Despite constant federal budget threats, locally we have made great strides to both address the crisis head on, as well as to create and update the tools we need over the long term to confront this issue. I'd like to take a moment to provide an overview of these tools. Together with the support of City Council, Mayor de Blasio has committed an unprecedented amount of resources to build and preserve affordable housing. HPD expanded the commitment to affordable housing production and preservation with the announcement of HNY 2.0, which laid a roadmap to expanding the HNY plan to create 300,000 units of affordable housing by 2026. This announcement was coupled with the dedication of $13.5 billion in mayoral capital to be spent towards affordable housing production and preservation through 2026. The administration has financed the construction of 28,492 units and the preservation of 59,065 units towards these HNY goals. Last calendar year, HPD financed more than 24,500 affordable homes. About 50% of that housing serves households with an income of under $43,000 for a family of three. As well, since 2014, the administration has provided funding for legal services and legislation to guarantee legal counsel for 180,000 low-income tenants facing eviction. We have also taken part in a multi-agency anti-harassment task force with our state colleagues. We also work to expand the screen injury programs to freeze the rents of more eligible seniors and New Yorkers with disabilities. We also worked with City Council to pass laws that prohibit harassing tenants with buyout officer offers, enhance enforcement tools to address poor housing conditions, bring cases in housing court against owners who do not comply with outstanding violations, and seek findings of contempt and jail against recalcitrant landlords when necessary. We also worked with the City Council to expand a certification of no harassment policy to prevent displacement in areas most at risk 
by requiring a review of a building's recent history upon application for a material alteration building permit. We also work to create a speculation watch list, which is a data-driven approach to help protect residents from the threat of investments in rent-regulated buildings that could be an indicator they will be asked to leave to make way for higher paying residents. This work complements what rent regulation laws accomplish, which speaks to the importance of a comprehensive approach. For example, over the past few years, the Rent Guidelines Board issued historically low rent increases for the one million rent stabilized units in our city, which protected against rapidly rising rents for those regulated households. But the data we are here to discuss today shows that there are significant and continuing challenges we face. We'll show that there is, continues to be a mismatch between supply and demand. In fact, the typical New York City renter household is unable to, an aff to afford an apartment at the median rent. The strong demand for housing combined with the recovered financial health of the multifamily market has led to large scale new construction and development throughout the city. Given that the demand for housing consistently outpaces available supply, it is vital that the available supply of housing grows. This administration has worked that, to ensure that as supply grows, the private market is required to provide affordable housing. For example, in partnership with council, we passed mandatory inclusionary housing, which is the strongest inclusionary housing program in the nation, and it ensures that as housing supply grows through a rezoning action, a portion of that housing is permanently affordable. While vital, the growth in supply is not enough to address the housing shortage. W this, the housing shortage affects all New Yorkers, but acutely falls on those households that are able to afford only the lowest cost units. The pressure of market demand and lack of supply places everyday New Yorkers at risk of sharp rent increases, harassment, and displacement from their homes and communities. This brings us to the importance of rent stabilization laws. Rent stabilization laws provide a critical resource for about one million New York City households that must be protected and strengthened in order to provide lower income households the choice to live in our great city amidst our housing crisis. The law provides the largest source of low cost housing in the city and offers critical tenant protections that enable residents to remain in their homes and exercise the choice to stay in their neighborhoods. Rent stabilization also supports our affordable housing work. HPD financed units become stabilized in exchange for our investments, which provides an extra layer of protection for those residents. The rent law reforms of 2011 and 2015 made progress toward protecting our rent stabilized stock. By our estimates, these reforms helped to retain 100,000 units that otherwise would have exited rent stabilization. But given the market pressures facing our city, it is critical we do more. That's why in the coming 15 months, we'll be strongly advocating for additional rent regulation reforms to keep New Yorkers in their homes and curb predatory landlord practices. Our rent stabilization agenda in 2019 will be built on these principles. Retaining the rent stabilized stock and the quality of this stock over the long term, preserving affordability of this stock, especially at lower rents, ensuring current tenants are securing their homes and neighborhoods, and protecting the benefits of rent stabilization for future tenants. As we prepare to enact and advocate for additional reforms in Albany in 2019, we will be meeting with stakeholders in order to create a comprehensive rent regulation reform agenda. Your partnership feedback and advocacy is essential in this process. As this process unfolds, it remains clear that it takes a comprehensive approach to address our affordable housing shortage. Extending rent stabilization is essential to this overall effort. Before turning over to Assistant Commissioner Gomer, I'd like to re-emphasize what an enormous priority this is for this mayor and administration as we work towards creating and sharpening policies that work to make New York City America's fairest city. Rent stabilization laws are the key to remaining an economically diverse city and a thriving cultural metropolis. And I know that this is a focus we all share. Everyone's gonna have their chance to speak. We respect each other here. Uh, Chair Cornegy.
Thank you. Um, I am Elizabeth Gomer, Assistant Commissioner of Research and Evaluation at HPD. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to testify in support of Resolution Number 188A and Introduction Number 600-A. These two important measures represent local confirmation of the continued housing emergency in New York City and are required in order to continue our system of rent control and stabilization. Simply put, they are what makes the extension of the rent control and rent stabilization laws possible. As you know, the City Council must pass these two pieces of legislation 30 days after receipt of the findings of the Housing and Vacancy Survey, and the Mayor must sign the legislation before April 1st. HPD submitted selected initial findings of the 2017 HVS to the Council on February 9th, 2018. Our testimony today will present initial findings of the 2017 New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey. This survey of the city's housing stock has been carried out every three years since 1965. It is the longest running housing survey in the country and is of critical importance for understanding how our city is changing and what we can and should do to support improvements in policy and programming. Its methodology has remained consistent over time with only minor changes to improve reliability and validity. It is conducted by the United States Census Bureau at the request of the City of New York. Interviews for the current survey were conducted between January and June 2017. This makes it the most up-to-date representative data on New York City currently available. As required by state and local law, the purpose of the survey is to establish the net rental vacancy rate, which is used to determine if New York City is in a state of housing emergency. Local law also requires that a survey be conducted to examine the supply of housing, the condition of housing, and the need for continuing regulation and control of residential rents and evictions. Today, we will share key statistics on the current state of housing as well as provide a more detailed portrait of the rent stabilized stock and tenants living in stabilized units. As with past waves of the HVS, more detailed analysis will be made available over the coming months and the Census Bureau plans to release the microdata later this summer for analysis by a range of policymakers, policy researchers, and academics who utilize the HVS in their everyday work. The 2017 Housing and Vacancy Survey reports the vacancy rate in rental apartments in New York City to be 3.63%, significantly below the 5% net rental vacancy rate threshold set forth in state and local laws as the condition determining that a housing emergency continues to exist. As the figure shows, the net rental vacancy rate varies by rent level. Among the lowest cost units, those with asking rents below $800, the vacancy rate is 1.2%, while among the highest rent levels, it is above the 5% threshold. Units with asking rents of $2,000 to $2,499 have a 5.2% vacancy rate, and those with asking rents at or above $2,500 have an 8.7% vacancy rate. New York City continues to see growth in the housing inventory, in 2017, we estimate that the stock comprises 3.47 million units. This is the largest housing stock recorded since the HVS began in 1965. As a reminder, this estimate is a snapshot of the current housing stock, and the increase of 69,000 units since 2014 represents a net change that results from both loss of stock as well as the creation of new units. The low vacancy rate, despite this record-breaking housing stock number, indicates that although supply has continued to increase, it has failed to keep pace with the continuing demand for housing. In 2017, there were approximately 966,000 rent-stabilized units, representing 44% of the overall rental stock. As with our estimates of the overall housing inventory, this represents a point-in-time estimate that accounts for both the loss of rent stabilized units as well as newly stabilized units that have come online. We continue to improve the data and methodology of the HVS with each successive wave. 
In 2017, we again improved the accuracy and validity of our estimates of units subject to rent stabilization. This estimate of 966,000 units is statistically equivalent to the number of units that were rent stabilized in both 2011 and 2014 if the same methodology were applied. As this map shows, these units are located throughout the five boroughs, but are concentrated in the Bronx and Manhattan, as well as parts of Brooklyn and Queens. The areas where we see the fewest number of rent stabilized units are parts of the city where we know that homeownership rates are high. The HVS measures housing conditions in several ways, including through self-report of the current occupants regarding maintenance deficiencies. One important measure of housing quality is the count of items reported by the current occupants, with five or more deficiencies representing a unit with critical deficits. In 2017, 3.6% of renter-occupied units reported five or more deficiencies. This is the lowest prevalence on record since 1991 when the HVS began using this measure. Although not shown here, we found that housing quality is as good or better on nearly every measure included in the HVS. Since 1991, the HVS has also collected data regarding neighborhood conditions and quality. In two, two, 2017, 76.1% of renter-occupied households rated the condition of the residential structures in their neighborhood as either excellent or good. And again, this is the highest on record since we began using this measure in 1991. As you know, for many years, rents continued to increase while wages stagnated. As first seen in other census surveys, that trend has finally reversed. In 2017, the HVS estimated that household incomes among renters rose by 10.9% in real terms, while rents increased by 6.2%. Incomes grew more than rents in both rent-stabilized tenants, as well as those living in private, non-regulated rental units. Despite the increase in median income, we continue to face a severe affordability challenge. According to the 2017 HVS, the median household income for renters was $47,200. That's equivalent to a monthly income of $3,933 before any taxes. Using standard federal guidelines that suggest a household should pay no more than 30% of gross income on housing costs, the typical renter household could afford to pay as much as $1,180 in rent and utilities. But the median contract rent in 2017 was $1,337, and it was $1,450 when we factor in the cost of utilities, which are also high. Moreover, the median asking rent of units available right now in the market is $1,875, well above the $1,180 the typical household could afford to pay. What results is a high prevalence of rent burden across nearly every income level. In 2017, we found that 56% of renter households were rent burdened or paying more than 30% of income for housing each month. 32% were severely burdened or paying more than 50% of income for housing. This graph shows the prevalence of rent burden by HUD income limits, or AMI, which is a relative measure of income that factors in differences in household size and local market conditions. When we roll this up uh, by income group, we see different facets of our affordability crisis. In the first bar, which includes households that are extremely low income, typically at or near the federal poverty line, we see that about half of households, or just over 360,000, are rent burdened. Of those who are rent burdened in this income stratum, almost all are severely burdened. The remaining 50%, those in the gray portion of the stacked bar, are largely served by subsidized housing or otherwise receiving some form of rental assistance. But the second bar, these are households designated as very low income or low income. A larger share are rent burdened. Here about 60% are paying 30 more than 30% of income toward housing costs each month. And that's equivalent to about 425,000 rent burdened households who are very low or low income. Of those, 165,000 are severely burdened or paying more than half of income toward housing costs. 
Again, the remainder is either receiving some form of assistance with housing costs or living in a private market in lower cost units. The HVS helps to identify the components of this affordability challenge. One side is rent burden based on the intersection of housing costs and incomes. But another critical component is the overall composition of our rental inventory. Between 2014 and 17, we saw a, no a large net loss of the lowest cost units as rents shifted upwards. This graph shows the number of rental units by rent level as measured by the 2014 and 2017 HVSs. The bars on the left show the number of units renting for less than 1,500 in both 2014 and 2017. The bars on the right show the number of units renting for 1,500 or more, again, in both 14 and 17 HVSs. As you can see, over this time period, there was a net decrease of low cost units and a corresponding increase of higher cost units. While we saw an overall increase of 6.2% in median gross rent, there is substantial variation by neighborhood. In particular, parts of Brooklyn and Queens have seen substantial increases in median rental costs. This map shows the changes in median gross rent among only the subset of units that are rent stabilized by neighborhood. As you can see, many neighbors, neighborhoods experienced little or no change in rent. That's indicated in the gray. Uh, many neighborhoods that saw large increases in overall rental costs saw lower increases for stabilized units. This is particularly true for parts of Brooklyn, Fort Greene, Bed-Stuy, Park Slope, um, Queens, particularly Ridgewood, um, and in Manhattan, including East Harlem, Washington Heights, Inwood, and the Upper West Side. In evaluating the continued need for rent stabilization, it is important to examine the demographics of who is served. Here we see the income distribution of rent stabilized tenants. 64% are low income, that is uh, earning up to 80% of HUD income limits or AMI. That's equivalent to about 610,000 households. And an additional 23% are either moderate or middle income. In summary, New York City continues to face a housing emergency with a net rental vacancy rate of 3.63%. While we have added to the overall stock of housing, it is insufficient to keep pace with demand. We continue to have about 966,000 rent stabilized units in our city located throughout the five boroughs. Both housing and neighborhood conditions are good and many dimensions have improved since 2014. There is a clear and continuing need for rent regulation in New York City. The 2017 HVS shows that while renter incomes have increased more than rents, there continues to be an affordability crisis. Half of renter households are rent burdened, one third are severely burdened. Median rents are not affordable to the typical New York household. Rent stabilized rents rose less sharply and represent a large and generally lower cost portion of the stock. And moreover, the majority of rent stabilized tenants are low income. Taking all of these first findings into consideration, we find that New York City continues its state of housing emergency. The shortage is particularly acute for lower income households who face the lowest vacancy rates and a shrinking stock of lower cost units. It is clear from the 2017 HVS that we must not only continue to add to the overall stock to address the emergency, but specifically add lower cost units and work to retain existing units with lower rents in order to support everyday New Yorkers who face continued affordability challenges. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. At this time, we'll have questions from uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you for your uh, detailed testimony. It's great to actually dig down into the numbers and to understand the composition of our rental inventory, the uh, wage uh, gaps that exist, and understanding what the needs really are. So it was very, very helpful to understand the details of the ho housing vacancy survey. Could you speak a little bit, and I, I know we have folks here today who are in rent control departments. Can you talk a little bit about I know we're talking about two different things, 
uh, on how they're categorized and the rent controlled stock has dwindled quite a bit. If you could speak a little bit to not just the rent stabilized units, but also the rent controlled units. Certainly. So as you know, um, and for the benefit of those who are not as familiar with the details of the policy, I'm sorry? If you could just speak a little louder for the gentleman. Is that better? Can you hear me? Um, S sir, if you want to come sit up front here, you can, if it's going to be easier for you to hear. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so for those of you who are not as familiar, uh, rent control is, of course, an important part of our stock, of the rent regulated stock. Um, and is the original rent regulation policies um, that are for units where the current occupants or the original occupant successors have been in continu continuous residence since July 1st of 1971. Um, this as, and as those original occupants or their successors leave those units, they transition to being rent stabilized. Um, so the HVS has tracked rent controlled as well as rent stabilized in other types of housing um, over many decades. Um, in 2017, there are about 22,000 remaining rent controlled units. Um, and of course, those are, that's a very small share, but the occupants of those units are particularly vulnerable and largely comprised of seniors and those who have aged in place. Sure. Sir, sure. sir, you're going to have the opportunity to testify. We asked the, yes, you will. If you, sign, you up. sign up, sir, sir, please be respectful. Everyone else is. Thank you for answering the question. We really appreciate it. Um, so you talked a little bit about the methodology uh, in the survey and how you analyze the data. What did HPD and the U.S. Census Bureau change in the methodology from three years ago up until now? So as I mentioned in my testimony, with each wave of the HVS, we seek to make um, very surgical improvements that increase our overall validity and the accuracy of our estimates. For 2017, um, we incorporated additional administrative data on the rent stabilized stock that we had not previously incorporated. This was information about units that had exited rent stabilization in the past. So for example, through vacancy decontrol or through expiring tax benefits. Um, the information we incorporated newly into 2017 was on about 62,000 units that had been decontrolled at some time before our survey. Um, the vast majority of those, about 47,000, had decontrolled at some point between 1993 and 2010. So those are older uh, units that had previously exited that had not been factored in until 2017. So what do you think was wrong with the previous methodology, that it wasn't doing the things that you just said? Are there other additional things that we could be doing to make sure that we have the most accurate data we need to make these decisions? Sure. So. As I said, we always are striving and open to any and all thoughts on how we can improve what we do. And that's, of course, balancing with consistency while, as you said, making sure that our data are the most accurate and complete as possible. Um, previous methodology used a combination of sources of information, which we continue to use even in 2017. Information from Department of Homes and Community Renewal, DHCR, um, from the Department of Finance, of course, from HPD, and from the information we gathered directly from occupants, um, such as the year that they moved in, their rent levels, et cetera. Um, by incorporating this additional information on units that are permanently exempt and registered as such with DHCR, we're able to incorporate yet one more piece of critical information to make sure that our current estimate of 966,000 units represents the full universe of units subject to rent stabilization. Does the administration support the repeal of vacancy decontrol? Um, hello, my name is Frances Marti, Assistant Commissioner for Government Affairs. It's still early on in the process and we are finalizing our agenda for rent renewal next year. This item is definitely something that we are looking at. Uh, we know from past reforms that we should not focus exclusively on one item, that it is important to no, look no, at. No, 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 this is a yes or no question. <laughs> Do you, does, is the administration's sure. position sure. that you support the repeal of vacancy decontrol or not? Sure. Um, you know, we share the same view as the council that 
this is an unfair policy and that it needs to be addressed. Right. I, yeah, yeah. Do you I, I, I don't have anything further to add because we are still formulating the agenda, but I think I take uh, your position and I will take it back to my colleagues in the HPD and the administration. I am flabbergasted by uh, that answer. And I think you're going to hear from tenants today on why uh, they're likely flabbergasted as well by that answer from this administration that has made affordable housing and the preservation of affordable housing a cornerstone item the last four years. We know the best way to preserve affordable housing is through repealing vacancy decontrol, which is how we've lost the most number of units since it was repealed. No, I, I mean, I do want to clarify, we do share we do share your view that this is an unfair policy that leads to the loss of rent stabilized units and we are going to be working with you on addressing this in the rent reforms next year. Uh, we, want to keep, we want to keep an open mind as we formulate our rent reform agenda. Uh, you know, we are further analyzing the data and we have to engage stakeholders in, in discussions and as, I, and as I said before, there are different levers that need to be pulled in concert in order to maximize the amount of units we want to be, we want to preserve. Well, when the mayor ran for mayor, he supported the repeal of vacancy decontrol. And we stand by that commitment. And when the rent laws expired in 2015, I believe, or were up for renewal in 2015, the mayor supported the repeal of vacancy decontrol. And what we know, uh, as a council and as tenant activists who are here is that it's not helpful to weigh in next year, it's helpful to weigh in now. That, I think, is the most important thing. So um, I, I really hope that you all will take a leadership role in this um, in a meaningful way. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, there are plenty of colleagues here that have questions, uh, so I'm not gonna ask about preferential rent, which they will ask about. I'm not gonna ask about the vacancy bonus, which they will ask about. I'm not gonna ask about MCI uh, changes, which they will ask about, but these are all uh, things that I think are uh, pretty important as we talk about the future of renewal and strengthening of rent regulation and uh, rent control. I will say this though, uh, Councilmember Torres uh, is not here, but he had a press conference this morning um, working with uh, the Housing Rights Initiative to uh, look at the, some buildings owned by Jared Kushner on the falsification of Department of Building forms where construction was being done in buildings and uh, the Jared Kushner and his company did not, um, did not uh, check off the forms that there were rent regulated tenants uh, in uh, those buildings. And we wanna make sure that HPD is coordinating with the Department of Buildings uh, to not allow this to happen in the future. So if you could talk a bit about what HPD is doing to ensure that the Department of Buildings is working in coordination with you all to protect rent regulated, rent controlled tenants. Yes, we saw that news and um, it's extremely disappointing. I can say this administration is laser focused on preventing tenant harassment. Um, it's our understanding that DOB did go to that site for uh, tenant safety inspections. Uh, DOB will have um, more information about um, those particular uh, sites and buildings, um, but I, but I can say that um, we do coordinate with the Department of Buildings on um, anti-harassment anti task force, uh, two anti-harassment task forces. Um, I can also say that in situations like these, the, um, we have worked with City Council to create some more proactive tools. So for example, something like the acquisition of rent regulated buildings, uh, which is what took place uh, from my understanding in this case. Um, we worked with Councilman Torres um, and to create a speculation watch list, um, which will be coming out this year. Uh, the speculation watch list takes a look at rent regulated buildings that transact and looks at a ratio between their rent roll and the acquisition price for a very low amount. So meaning that 
a building might have been um, purchased for more amount than even the market would say can support that rent roll. We expect that going forward um, in tools like this, uh, speculation watch list would catch transactions like that so we can be, it's more on um, HPD's radar that there might be an indication that a building is at risk of tenant harassment or uh, tenants being offered buyouts. As well, we work to expand the certification of no harassment policy. Certification of no harassment requires that a um, owner seek out a uh, certification from HPD upon applying for a permit from the Department of Buildings. Um, for buildings that indicate something about um, their uh, residence or their transaction or their financial or physical distress that says this warrants a deeper look. Um, so when that takes place, the, um, the city is in a position of doing an investigation. I, um, sorry, I'd like to clarify my earlier statement. I'd just like to say that we do support the repeal of vacant city control. So Thank I'd you. just like to state that for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Cornegie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you for clearing that up, administration. The median asking rent increased 33.9% uh, from 2014 to 2017. Have you done any analysis to see if there is a correlation between displacement and the increase of rent in certain neighborhoods? Thank you for your question. Um, we only received the 2017 data about two weeks ago, so this is very early in our cycle that goes up to three years. We have not yet begun doing analysis like your question on the increase in rents and other factors such as displacement, but we are very anxious to speak with any member of the city council about priority analytic issues so that we can prioritize those as we begin our research agenda based on the 2017 HVS. Well, so I would just rephrase my question. Will you be doing we will, we will certainly consider how we can use our data to be able to estimate that phenomenon, which we know is a critical problem, but we have to be able to work out the statistical methodology to do so. I'm committed to sitting down and seeing if that is something that we can do with the data we currently collect. I think the, the, the data derived from a close look mm -hmm. could be very helpful in the city going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know I happen to represent uh, what I believe to be the epicenter of gentrification, which is bed and Northern Crown Heights. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's incredibly in important for not only my constituency, but for the city mm -hmm. to have good, solid, understanding of the correlation between the two. Anecdotally, mm -hmm. I think everybody in this room would believe that there is a correlation. Um, and so I think it would be a, a probably paramount to do this sooner than later. So I will certainly personally be reaching out to your office to follow through. Sure, and we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. I also want to let um, acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by Council Member Rivera. We can go to Council Member questions now. Keith Powers. Thank you, and thank you for having this hearing. And uh, uh, first, I want to welcome my my leader of my tenants association, Susan Steinberg from Peter Cooper Stives in town, who uh, has been leading, I think, the charge uh, along with many others in this room in the city for preserving and protecting tenants and rent regulated apartments. And I had the benefit of growing up in a rent stabilized apartment, and I care I care deeply about continuing the future for many more. And I thank HPD um, for your work in that area. And I'm, I'm glad you do support vacancy decontrol. control. I do too, uh, I, but and much more. And I hope we're not waiting until next year to be fighting the fight in Albany. Every single year, MCI reform, preferential rent reform, vacancy bonuses, vacancy decontrol. control, you name it. You have our support and my support. Um, and and any, I want to ask a few questions. <clears throat> um, so much of this goes to Albany, but today, and I think Councilmember Torres' um, uh, report and, and oversight around Department of Building permits and other processes here at the city level does highlight the fact that the city plays a role in preserving rent stabilization and rent control units. Uh, can you give us more information or maybe, maybe provide us with more details of either le existing legislation that you have or you're looking at or other tools that might be available to the council so we don't have to go to, and, and I, I do note that tenants are going up to Albany next week to continue this fight, but that we don't have to go to Albany. What, what is available to us? What should we be looking at? Or what is HPD looking at in terms of preserving rent stabilized units or, 
or or ensuring that they don't go out of the the rent regulation rent stabilization program sure give me one second um, so in addition to some of the tools I mentioned in terms of the certification of no harassment and um, which builds into the process an opportunity for community boards and for tenant groups to um, weigh in when there is a application um, and the predatory equity watch list, um, there are some key things that we've done at the local level um, and we want to use these and also build on these. Um, so. Uh, HRA has provided free legal services for 180,000 um, New Yorkers since 2014, um, and evictions total are down by 27%. Um, supporting this tool going forward and making sure that people are aware that this is a resource available to them is critical. Um, enforcing the Housing Maintenance Code in general is um, an anti-harassment effort. This includes calling 311 there when there are um, heat outages or any other uh, complaint. Um, HPD inspectors respond to uh, those complaints. Um, and we have done about, um, it, we've attempted nearly 873,000 inspections just in FY17. Um, and we issued 481,000 violations. Thank you, and I, and I know I'm over my time, but I'm just gonna ask maybe one or two follow-up questions. <clears throat> in, in terms of today's particular, I know it's, an, it's, it's an investigation into whether something happened or not, so we're, we're, we're far away from actually making a determination, but it, beyond just the legal services, which are very important, I, I, my concern is always when you have agencies that aren't talking to each other. In this case, I think Department of Finance was receiving one piece of information, HPD or DOB rather was receiving another piece of information. So it seems like in some cases, we, we as a city, I'm taking a blame for this too, are not doing enough to ensure that our own processes are talking to each other and ensuring that we're not putting people to space. So I'd like to follow up, if we can, um, on that topic about ways we can improve internal agency conversations and communications. I just want to ask one more question, and before I do that, I want to just say one thank you to the chairman for putting tenants first because uh, I think their voice is, is important, and we've done that with the NYCHA tenants and now rent stabilization as well and rent regulation is to let tenants speak about their issues, and then we have an opportunity to talk to the agencies as well. So I want to thank him for that. Um, in terms of rent burden, particularly, um, we have programs like SCREE, which I think are wonderful, and we've expanded SCREE in the last few years to reduce rent burden. Are there other ways, either in HPD-funded projects or deals or, uh, or other things you're looking at to not just obviously expand rent protection where they exist already, but to look at tenants that are being rent burdened and might be at risk of losing their apartment, which is a good rent regulated apartment. Um, a a any tools that you are, you're using or looking at to address the rent burden in, in addition to the expansion of available units? A lot of the um, issue around rent burden that the tools that we use are related to our preservation work. Um, this includes uh, tax incentives, uh, loan programs that work together to um, bring financing to buildings to help improve those conditions. Along with that includes a um, uh, rent setting that is at 30% of tenant income. So by supporting a lot of our preservation work and by getting those tools out. One of the things I'd like to uh, mention is we are working on um, coming out with a new program, na the Neighborhood Pillars Program, which is targeted to, um, to spend more and use more sources of financing um, in order to work to acquire rent-stabilized buildings. Um, so, this is a, an exciting program for us because we're working to actually compete with the market and become more targeted with our acquisitions. Um, but ultimately, the goal of all of our preservation work is to get tenants in a place of a habitable home, quality, and spending no more than 30% of their income on their rent. Thank you. Council Member Chair. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to all the tenants and advocates for being here today. Um, from your testimony, 
we all know that we need to um, continue rent regulation and all the reason that you laid out in testimony, I think residents know and advocates know and we've been saying that all, all along. Um, when you look at in your testimony um, that the least vacant units are the lower rent ones. Everybody knows that because what's happening right now is that so many market rate units are, are coming online. And even some of them, they, they get the 421A tax uh, incentive. They only give back 20%. Um, so there is a big discrepancy and big gap. And I, I remember just this past Sunday reading the New York Times. You look at, you know, there are all these competition going on in Brooklyn because all these market rate housing is, is going up and the next one is going to be taller. They're going to offer more amenities because they want to attract um, the tenants, so people who could afford it, they're picking and choosing. But the people who cannot afford it, they're stuck. And I think in, in your um, vacancy surveys, do you, take cons do you take a look at overcrowding? Because what we see in our neighborhood is that people are doubling up, tripling up. There's no more one family living in an apartment. Oftentimes, they have to share apartment with another family just to pay the rent. So I, that's one question. The other question is that I know that you're um, talking about um, the program uh, to help a nonprofit group acquire uh, rent regulated building uh, or non rent regulated building. That's great. I was very excited about that in the last hearing. One of the things I also want to raise is that is HPD looking into, first of all, doing some project based uh, subsidy program where new development, uh, the, that developer can use that to lower, to lower the income uh, requirement. In, in that way, they will lower the rent. That's one thing. And the other thing is to look at a subsidy that the city can do to help families who are rent burned, similar to what we have in Scree and Dree, but for low-income family, so that they can be able to meet um, the rent and be able to stay in their rent regulated apartment. Thank you very much. So let me maybe take the first question. I'll defer to my colleagues on, on the follow up question. Um, so the HVS does measure, does collect a lot of data that can help us examine different facets of crowding or doubling up. Um, in our selected initial findings, they didn't present obviously all of our wonderful numbers today. Um, but you can see the overcrowding rate uh, from a single dimension in Table 19 of what had been previously distributed to you. Um, for 2017, um, across all types of rental housing, um, the crowding rate was 11.5% in 2017. Um, and severely crowded, that's where there's more than one and a half persons per room, um, was a rate of 4.5%. Um, that's statistically pretty similar to what we had measured it as in 2014. Do you break that down by the, the rent? We certainly can do that. I'm happy to do that as a follow-up. Um, in our selected findings, we only show a very small number of, of um, metrics, um, but we can do that by rent level, and we're happy to do that as a follow-up for you. Thank you. Sure. The other question about sure. subsidies? Sure. So we're rolling out a New York City 1515 rental assistance program uh, for supportive housing. Um, well, we're, we'll have six new staff and $250,000 in FY18 for this program. Uh, we can arrange uh, a briefing. Well, I know about the supportive housing. Yeah. I'm talking about the general population, about by the low-income families who are struggling um, so that they should um, have some kind of before they get to the homeless shelter, if we can prevent them from you know, becoming homeless and be able to stay in their homes. Uh, yes, we have to look towards the state right. to help, but if the city can do something uh, on our own to really help this family, that's one thing. And the other one is that in developing more affordable unit that is for the lower income level, the city can take a look at creating a project-based subsidy program that allows developers to do that? 
I, I, I think it's a I think it's a fair idea, and we we're happy to discuss it with you further. I think we should also be mindful right now. Uh, defending Section 8 at the federal level is very important, and we appreciate all your partnership and support. Um, all these federal programs are under threat, um, so I just say like we are focused on defending uh, Section 8 um, at the federal level, but we are more than happy to sit down with you and discuss. Um, the idea that you are putting forward right now. Yeah, I mean, I know that we have to defend Section 8, but right. while we're defending that, yep. let's also be creative sure. and find new ways uh, to help the tenants who are suffering, who needs our support, so yep. so that we don't yep. just always be on the defensive. Yep. Let's be on the offensive, yep. too. We're okay? happy to talk about that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank you uh, for your testimony. I just... Uh, I had a few things to say, but you, you kind of surprised me on the preferential rent thing, so I know um, you cleaned, cleaned it up. But I just want to make sure I'm also clear that you're supporting uh, the changing of uh, MCIs and uh, IAIs, um, um, individual, um, IAIs uh, and preferential rent, all of those things that the movement is usually pushing. I just want to make sure that the administration supports dealing with those or getting rid of those. So again, I. I think those are definitely issues we're going to be looking at, um, and we're not just looking at it. Support changing MCIs, AIs, changing preferential rent, and high rent decontrol. So, as I can just add here, as somebody who has um, worked for HPD and worked on these issues now for several rounds of of, um, of Albany reforms. Um, and we'll, you're looking at one of the critical set of team, the team members who will be doing this for in the next 15 months, that um, my, my component of that is doing really detailed data analysis from the HVS and from other sources to be able to help guide um, not just internal with the administration, but also to help support just a data-driven So I'm approach. sorry, I have a minute and 30 seconds left. I, I didn't expect this to be a question because I thought it was a yes, so I just want to know if those things were in concert in terms of getting rid of or fixing? That's my question. The answer is yes, we're going okay. to be looking at, we're going okay. to be looking at both of those I just things. want to make yep. sure we have that um, on the record because yep. I was yep. a little concerned. Um, so this, uh, this issue in particular, um, you know, I wouldn't be a, a council member if it wasn't for my tenant organizing days. Um, before Barack Obama, no one knew what it was, so people would ask me if I was giving tenants lessons, and I'd have to tell them no, it was actually tenant organizing I was doing. Uh, so I've been doing this for, for way back. It's very, very um, important uh, to me. I do want to make sure I get to ask some of the advocates at some point. I was concerned, I guess, by the, the redoing the HVS, it looked like we didn't actually lose um, units, which I'm, I just want to make sure we're checking um, the validity of that, because our, our usual belief is that we're losing a lot of units, and perhaps we're just building more luxury units and why it's compensating for what we're actually uh, losing. So I, I just want to get into that, but I can't get into it here. <clears throat> um, also, um, yes, it looked like there was some good news about in income raising, I guess, versus rents, but we still have a, a big crunch uh, at the bottom. Um, and I will say, for the most part, I think the city's doing decent. There's, there's bones I have to pick. Uh, we did lose from your chart particularly on lower income in the years of 14, 17, which is one of the reasons I voted against MIH, and I think this body and the mayor failed by not making it um, a deeper permanent affordability. We're finally cleaning that up now, but we did lose some critical years. Um, I'm happy the 421A recapture is happening. Uh, I do want to see more happen with rent regulation, so hopefully the city will, but I just want to put on the record, and I sometimes try to use um, qualifying statements, but I'm not here. Governor Cuomo, has been an utter failure when it comes to rent regulation, both on rent control, rent stabilization. This is primarily, not only, but primarily a state issue, and he has thoroughly failed. There's some breaking news happening now that I hope will pressure him uh, a little bit more, um, but I hope he's listening, because the one thing I think he's done well is probably the tenant protection unit. I will say that has done some good things. We wouldn't need it if he would do his job. The fact that he, first of all, failed on the 421 negotiations and took it out of the negotiations that we used to have with rent regulations is another failure. Um, I'm just so dismayed by what I see coming out of there, and I think it's deeply connected to the amounts of money that he receives from developers and landlords, um, and 
I won't speak into detail, but I've had reason to be traveling across the state, and um, I've been shocked and surprised of how much the housing issue and the homeless issue in New York City is connected across the city, and I want to shout out Housing Justice for All who's trying to bridge uh, some of those divides uh, because it all goes back to the state, particularly the gubernatorial mansion. So I'm going to continue to push the city where I can, but I want to make sure we're clear on where the buck stops with this one. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Williams. Um, I just want to shift to have a brief conversation about something that's not talked about much, but that is quintessential to uh, life uh, and vibrancy in New York City, and that is uh, citywide home ownership. The citywide home, home ownership rate was 32.4% in 2017, statistically the same as 2014. How did the city plan to preserve or create more affordable home ownership opportunities? Thank you for the question. Um, and as most know, New York City is the inverse of the rest of the country in terms of its relationship between renters and homeowners, which makes us in a unique position um, to create home ownership policy. So as an administration, um, we do look at home ownership as both stabilizing distressed neighborhoods, a tool for that, as well as serving as a wealth building tool, um, so it's critical. Um, since the start of HNY, we have financed nearly 13,000 home ownership starts. Um, a portion of those are through um, NIHOP and our uh, Home First program. Um, and it's a, our expectation by 2026, the city will produce another 10,000 home ownership units. Um, so in HNY 2.0, we actually announced two new programs um, to confront this issue. Um, we are excited to launch a program called Open Door, which is a unique uh, new program where we are building co-op units affordable to people in the 80 to 130% AMI bracket, which is about 70,000 to 112,000 for family of three. Um, and that's just on the new construction side. We're also working to create the Home Fix program, which is about helping um, mostly lower income homeowners do repairs on their homes so that they can um, either bring them up to um, a more habitable status or just work to um, uh, maximize the quality of their home and maximize their asset. So we are, we are working on creating this. We, we recognize that we're a city of renters, but even still we have um, pockets of homeowners and we need to have tools that address their, ish their needs as well. So the overall number that you mentioned, which I, I believe I heard you say 10,000, that's the um, additional right. uh, units, yeah. So uh, how much of that is new homeowners and how much of it is the, the, the fixed program that you mentioned? Or is there a differentiation somewhere in there? Um, I don't have a breakdown of where the 10,000 uh, additional would come from. Um, I can say that in some cases we preserve Mitchell Lama co-ops um, and the preservation of Mitchell Lama co-ops are home ownership units. So for the new, potential new homeowners uh, in a very tough market, what is your strategy for getting a word out about new programs, about pathways to home ownership? Um, what, what, what's the strategy for getting people enrolled in the program and helping them build wealth and capacity and all of those kinds of things? Sure, yeah, it's a great question. Um, Part of it is building awareness. Um, we need everybody to support that. Um, following affordable housing lotteries um, and being able to know that even if you're in the market to purchase a home, that affordable housing lotteries can be for you. Um, so I encourage everybody to you know, visit our website and to look for resources related to home ownership. Um, there's also a number of local nonprofits that focus on home ownership. I will give a shout out to the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. A lot of home ownership programs are f focused on preventing foreclosure, um, but as the market has recovered and strengthened, there are more, um, more conversations about introducing new home ownership opportunities. So um, talking to nonprofits, local community organizations, talking to um, housing counseling agencies, uh, coming to our website and looking on the home ownership link um, and following affordable housing lotteries are just some of the ways, but I'd like to talk to you more about what more we could do. Yeah, so one of the things that I uh, am curious about is your relationship or the administration's relationship to the use, and, use of uh, CRA or the Community Reinvestment Act. 
uh, in minority communities uh, like the one that I represent, there's, an op there's, a, there's a great opportunity uh, there to get the CRA numbers up with banks in my district. We're actually doing an assessment of the banks in my district uh, uh, for their lending practices, both commercial and residential. I'm wondering, is the city use, um, uh, counting that as a tool for increasing home ownership, or are these programs operating mutually exclusive of each other? That's a great question. Um, at the moment, you know, we don't count uh, what banks count towards CRA unless mostly if it's the financing of multifamily housing um, and investments in the tax credit program. But it's a great opportunity. I do want to highlight a couple things. Um, usually the news in regards to housing on the federal level is bad these days. And I just want to point out that not a lot of people are familiar that there is a proposal to uh, eliminate reporting by banks on just the thing you mentioned. Banks are required right now to report on the race ethnicity of um, people that receive home mortgage loans as a way to confront past mortgage discrimination. Um, and there is a proposal to it. This is called the Home, home Mortgage Disclosure Act. And we use this data, HUMDA data. Um, and I would like to talk to you more about how we can use that data more effectively. However, it's just another example of something that's at risk at the federal level. Uh, we are working to fight it because we do use this data. Um, but there's conversations about reforming the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, there are conversations about taking away this data. And you know we need all the support we can to continue those tools because the Housing and Vacancy Survey shows us just how critical you need data to have these conversations. Otherwise, um, the anecdotal evidence uh, in regards to these issues um, is simply not always enough. So we should talk more um, because there is an opportunity to work more closely with banks. We talk with banks a lot about what further investments could be made um, and they want to um, do increasing amounts of home ownership. So I'd like to follow up with you about that. Yeah, so it's, it's obvious, not obviously, but it's something that we're doing uh, in my district as a combat to um, uh, some of the negative sides or the downsides of gentrification. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be a pathway in my district. I can imagine if the weight of the entire city was brought to bear as it relates to the CRA, the difference we could possibly make. So I look forward to not um, just on the record having this conversation, but having a longer extended conversation and not just with myself, but with the committee on what we can do uh, working with our federal partners and with the act. So thank you. Great, thanks. Councilmember Jonah. Chair, I just want to thank you for this uh, very important hearing and uh, my colleagues for bringing up some uh, very important issues uh, and topics. Um, you mentioned your testimony, uh, Scree and Dree. Can you please tell me uh, your feelings or your thoughts on the success of those two programs? Um, go ahead. So um, we're actually very proud of the recent expansion in Scree. Um, I think the state, legis the state legislature passed an expansion to 50,000, mm -hmm. and we implemented it locally. Um, and you know, this is a this is a success in, in making sure that more seniors can stay in their homes. Um, Um, in, in regards to, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the SCREE program, uh, DOF administers um, the SCREE program for rent regulated units. We do it for Mitchell Lama and HDFCs. Um, we'd be happy to, like, sit down with you and, and go over more, yeah, more detail. But overall, these are very successful and important programs to Absolutely. make sure that our right. seniors and uh, disability, those suffering from various disabilities, remain in their homes and not allowing their rent to increase is significant. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can also add that the HES collects data um, on the population receiving SCREE. Um, we have not yet incorporated questions on DRE. Um, but one of the things that we'd be happy to follow up on is as we get to the point where we're evaluating and analyzing the impact of SCREE over time of sharing any findings we have with you on that program. Because I feel the same way, um, making sure that those two programs remain viable um, are uh, important to the well-being of this city. Would your department be open to discussing extending those programs or those protections to everyday New Yorkers, 
uh, where we would cap rents, um, and it's known as the tree bill, the tenant rent increase exemption program, where if more than half of their rent is going toward rent, and here it's a third, um, that we would cap those rents and not let things get progressively worse for those very vulnerable families. So well, we are always happy to review any legislative proposal. I just want to be clear that we are laser focused on strengthening the rent laws in Albany next year. Mm -hmm. That is our focus, and we don't think there's any substitute for that. So we just want to be clear about that. Uh, we are familiar with the proposal you are discussing, uh, Tree. Um, you know, I, the proposal would be administered by DOF, so they could speak better about it. However, we are familiar with uh, certain fiscal concerns, uh, significant fiscal concerns with this proposal. Fiscal concerns. We're talking about the well-being of keeping New Yorkers in their home and making sure that they don't become displaced and homeless. Isn't that the intent here? We, we believe that the best way of achieving that is strengthening the rent laws in Albany next year. So if you're one of the fortunate families that has a rent-stabilized apartment, you're protected, and the other New York City residents, we turn around and say, sorry, you didn't draw the luck, uh, and we can't help you. Is that the intent? Well, we, we can certainly discuss this proposal with you, and we're more than happy to do that. So let's clarify the position. It's more than making sure that the rent protections remain in place, but making sure that all New Yorkers can afford to live in this great city and not be forced into the streets. I mean, again, I would, that should be the primary objective, I yeah, would imagine. Again, we, we believe that strengthening the rent laws is the best way of achieving that, but we are more than happy to discuss the specifics of the tree proposal with you. Let me reiterate one more time. We have many more apartments that are not subject to rent stabilization, and those families are in current need of assistance. And helping secure a roof over their head should be the primary goal, not just there for the rent stabilized and rent controlled tenants. There has to be a much broader approach. But I'll take that up with you at a later time. One of the other issues I do want to bring up is um, the same group of people that we're looking to help through rent protections and making sure that RGB rent increases don't force these vulnerable families out of their homes. One of the issues that I see uh, works counter to that is the water and sewer and real estate tax increases that are passed on to property owners and therefore passed on to tenants. So on one hand, we say we need to strengthen rent protections, make sure rents remain affordable mm -hmm. and that they don't increase out of control, forcing families to relocate. On the other end, we raise the operating cost of buildings to make sure that we hurt those very existing tenants that we're looking to help. Water and sewer rates are over $1,000 an apartment annually. That is more than fuel. Your real estate taxes imposed on the same rent-stabilized tenants that you're looking to protect are at about $3,000 annually. These are double-digit increases across the board. So when are we going to start addressing the underlying issues? Are we here to help these tenants or hurt them? And under the guise of RGB saying we did our part, but those landlords are going to pass on those increases and make sure that those, tenant pay, those tenants and families pay for these increases. So the issue around operating expense increases, RGB, from my understanding, looks at annually when setting the um, uh, increase or the, in the one-year or two-year leases. There's a report that's done on operating expenses and how they are going up and down. Uh, in terms of affordable housing, um, uh, real estate uh, tax exemptions are used in order to keep costs down. So in order to house uh, the lower income tenants we're talking about, um, the city does provide an operating subsidy um, by uh, exempting property taxes. It's an incentive for people to participate in affordable housing. Then about rent apartments, the one million apartments that we want to protect. Those same one right. million apartments are subject to increases on water and sewer rates by New York City, on real estate taxes by New York City. They're a pass along, and I'll paint the picture for you. City charges landlord, landlord charges tenant. Tenant pays landlord, landlord pays city. Who's the culprit? It's not the landlord. He's the middleman. And these increases 
are a direct correlation to the rent increases that those rent-stabilized tenants that you're trying to protect will ultimately pay for. I also believe rent stabilization and the one million apartments that are available are not enough, and I agree with that this is a battle of supply versus demand, and New York City is not going to build its way out of this on its own, uh, that there has to be a more willing partnership with the private industry, creating the incentives for them to build more apartments, which will eventually lead to stabilizing of rents and uh, eventually making sure that uh, all New Yorkers can afford to live here, uh, should also have some type of needs testing to make sure that those that should be getting the protections do have the protections and ensuring future generations can thrive here. So I want to thank you both for your time. Thank you. Councilmember Rivera. Thank you. And thank you, Chair, for asking about home ownership. I know those opportunities in moderate income communities are far and few in between. So I wanted to ask about the survey. So compared to previous surveys, the number of rent controlled units was actually less. And I'd like to know why does there continue to be a loss of these units and whether HVS has data on the causes? Sure, so in my previous um, answer about rent control, I explained that this is the first generation of rent regulated units where the current occupants had, in fact have to be by definition the first occupants or the first occupant successors and have lived continuously in that unit since July 1st, 1971. Um, that means that when those units, when those first occupants exit those units, they transition to being rent stabilized. So the number of rent controlled units naturally declines over time as those initial occupants who have been living there for several decades give up those apartments. Um, but the overall supply of rent regulated units, which comprises both rent control and rent stabilized, um, remains intact according to our data. Well, based on my very uh, humble experience housing organizing, and I see some of my friends here, and we've done a lot of work around this, I think some of the causes are the same for rent stabilization as they are even for rent control, and that's, that's deprivation of services, that's frivolous litigation, that's harassment. I want to ask about repairs. You said that the agency issued 5,000 violations? I believe uh, it was 473,000. Four, 473,000 violations in how long? Uh, I think that was fiscal year 17, but if you give me a moment, I'll give you the exact number. We can also confirm that for you after that. He's going to confirm yeah. it for yeah. you right now. Okay. Uh, in fiscal year 17, uh, we issued more than 481,000 okay, that's Okay, that sounds right. So these violations, do you know how many of them um, were gathered because of an HP action? Uh, I don't have that information in front of me, but I can say that we have brought 6,371 cases to housing court. Um, a portion of those cases, I believe, are going to be uh, an HP action. But this is data we can follow up with you with. That would be great. I, I know that when people are taking their landlord to court, sometimes all the time and the energy that they spend in court and the vindication that they get is still almost worthless because the, the repairs don't come and they have to go back to court and then go back to court. And that's a loss of wages. That's a loss of time. And the stress on these tenants is unbelievable. So I see here that it says since 2014, the administration funded uh, legal services for 180,000 low-income tenants facing eviction. That seems a, a little bit low. I, I'd love to see that broken down, and I'd love to see how many people are actually in court who are, I guess, categorized as low-income and how many actually receive legal services. I know there's criteria and there's eligibility around it, but I, I know how many families are in court, and that just seems like I know we have to do our part. But if you can give me a breakdown of who is receiving those services according to income and according to borough, I, I would really appreciate that. Okay. Our partners at HRA run the program, so let us communicate with them and let you know of your uh, request, and we'll get back to you. And then the last thing I'll just say is I want to echo um, some of my colleagues here who talked about the joint effort. So whether it's with HRA or HCR or DOB, 
it, this is really a time where I feel like our tenants are constantly under attack. And finally, for, I guess, for example, Kushner to, to get some press around the false certification, you said it was disappointing. And I think it's more than disappointing, it's criminal. So for the people here who, who have been fighting Westminster for years, I have to say, you know, time is up for a lot of these guys and we're gonna need your help. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and I absolutely agree. Um, and this is why the harassment task forces exist, is to actually look into potentially criminal behavior as well. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Cornegie. Um, for chairing this hearing. It's incredibly important. I so appreciate um, Speaker Johnson, of course, the administration moving forward on his two uh, resolutions, bills. Um, I want to follow up on Councilmember Rivera's question. Um, when you saw a decrease in rent controlled apartments, did you see a corresponding increase in rent stabilized apartments or can you track to see whether or not that actually happened? So the data that we currently are analyzing and that we've shared today, our first findings, is cross-sectional, so it's only point in time. It does not enable us to say where those units had come from or what is happening to them, however, um, the HVS also is in, in its um, design a longitudinal data set. Um, and so with 2017 data, we will be able to analyze some of these uh, trends and transitions over time between 2011, 14, and 17. Unfortunately, we don't have those data yet. Um, we'll get them later this summer after the 2017 data themselves are released by the Census Bureau. Um, but we'd be more than happy to follow up and look at what has happened to the units that had been rent controlled in earlier waves and what happened to them after they transitioned. That'd be great. Hypothetically, do you have a, uh, a data field that captures brand new rent stabilized apartments? I'm not quite sure that I understand your question, but, but let me do my best to answer it. Um, so we, we certainly, just as we discuss rent control, we can look at over time um, what, how units transition from one category to another with that special longitudinal file. Okay. Um, the 2017 ad data themselves don't allow us to look at that change. Okay. Got you. And when do you expect uh, the full data to be available to the public? So the 2017 data will likely be released in June, which is similar to what the, our standard cycle is for an HVS wave. Um, the longitudinal data will be prepared at, sometime after that, probably late in the summer is when we expect to get a first copy of those data back at HPD. Okay. Um, one of my concerns and the reason uh, Councilmember Rivera's point really struck me is because I have a building in my district where the landlord is trying very hard, new landlord, a uh, new building owner came in and is trying very hard to pressure the, the tenants who are rent controlled to sign rent stabilization leases uh, with the intent of demolishing the building, you know, then moving to the phase of saying, well, we're gonna rebuild this and now everyone's out. So is, is that, can that type of situation be captured by your office in a different way or how do you keep track of those situations? So the HVS itself is really designed, you know, the, it, it is designed to do um, many things, but it really focuses on citywide borough trends of these major conditions um, and the things that are defined by both local and state law. It of course goes above and beyond that, but it can't do everything. Um, and so we are not able to look at the intersection of those particular issues in that survey. Um, I will say that my division separately does a lot of analysis of different data. Um, we haven't specifically looked at this um, idea of decontrol and demolition and the intersection of those particular things in the way you're describing. 
um, but we're always trying to understand what are the critical issues um, that, that everyone is seeing so that we can identify the best data and methodology. And we're certainly happy to think about that with you. And your yeah, I'd love to add that one to your list. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't, wouldn't it be true that you'd have to work with the DOB data, right, because they'll have the permits for demolition or, you know, yeah, it, it very much like our program areas have to work together with agencies, us data and research people also have to collaborate to make get the right data. Do your data, do your package, software package, do your data packages speak to each other? Can you use DOB data in your analysis? As certainly my division works with all kinds of data from all different but they agencies. Just I'm just curious, they just updated to DOB now or whatever. Is yeah, that we, in your... We, People, people in my division access a back end, so those kinds of changes don't alter our ability to be able to, to talk to so together specifically, and, and use data. So HPD and DOB uh, address, by address information could hypothetically speak to each other? And sure, the, the researchers who work on my team use all kinds of data all the time. Um, and we also share with other researchers at other agencies and outside of the city and, and all of those things can work together. Great. Thank you so much for your time and your efforts. Thank you, Chair. We're going to go to a second round. Uh, Councilmember Williams has uh, a second round of questions. Thank you. Kind of, I wasn't expecting to come up right now. Um, um, I did want to just make sure I put on um, the record also, sometimes when we're talking about rent stabilization, rent control, just rent regulation in general, we are talking about uh, the price point, and I always want to make sure I put on the record that is also the protections that come with it that people forget to discuss, and it's important because when I was an organizer and people would come for assistance, I would have to say, are you rent regulated or you're not? Because if you aren't, I can help you get the repair, but the landlord may not give you a lease renewal and we may or may not be able to prove that it's connected. And so I always want to make sure when we're discussing and having these talking points that the protections that are afforded to tenants in rent regulation are very important to that community and shouldn't just be connected to um, price point. I think I had another question, but it, uh, it's been jogged out of my head, but I want to make sure that was there. Um, also, just to recorrect some of my uh, earlier statements, just for our clarification, I think the governor has uh, utterly failed tenants in the city and across the state, not just rent regulated. Thank you. I think you made that abundantly clear, Councilman. I think I said rent regulated. I just want to make sure I captured thank you. the whole thing. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank we you. We have a, thank a you. next. Thank you. We look forward to working with you and I'll follow up, especially on the uh, home ownership piece. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. I'm going to call the next panel. Uh, Norma Shriver. Cynthia Chaffee, Abigail Martinez, and Marcella, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your last name. Maitierrez, Marcella, I'm sorry. Thank you. You have to press the button, and, and I'm glad you started because we actually intended to go from that side to that side. So, Good afternoon. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and Chair Cornegi, for your continued support for stronger rent laws and the opportunity uh, I'm to sorry, hold one second, please. If you can take the conversation outside, please. We are still in session. Thank you. 
and the opportunity to speak to the committee today. My name is Norma Schreier, and I am a member of the Rent Controlled Tenants Leadership Committee at Tenants and Neighbors. I am here to speak in support of Resolution 188A and Intro Number 600A. I am a rent control tenant living on the Upper West Side in the same apartment I moved into with my now deceased husband 50 years ago, now living with my disabled daughter. And I'm here today to testify on behalf of the approximately 50,000 rent control tenants remaining in 22,000 units in New York, down 4,000 since the previous HVS. We call ourselves the forgotten rent-regulated tenants, but perhaps now we won't be forgotten because there are about one million rent-stabilized apartments left in New York, so we do not get much attention. This year, rent control tenants lobbied Governor Cuomo for a rent freeze, even stopped traffic in front of his office. A bunch of septuagenarians and octogenarians and spent the day in jail because we are so desperate to bring attention to the rent control issue. We believe that the MBR system that controls rent adjustments for rent control tenants is outdated, unsustainable, and inhumane. Think about this. In the eight years of Governor Cuomo's administration, my rent has increased a whopping 44%. I repeat, 44%. In the same time, rent-stabilized tenants' rent has increased only 12%. The same economic conditions that exist in the city for rent-stabilized tenants and their landlords exist also for rent-control tenants. Why the discrepancy? Here's another thought. In 1975, there were 642,000 rent-controlled apartments in this city, compared to 22,000 currently. Some are folded into rent stabilization, but others, due to the MBR system that controls this form of rent regulation, and if a landlord is not too lazy to file the papers each year, most of our rents are more than that deregulation threshold for rent regulation, which is $2,700 per month. The biennial MBR factor at 7.4%, for which we just received an announcement from the DHCR, is much too high for rent control tenants in my tenants and neighbors group. And the broader rent control community, with this increase, tenants will continue to pay annual rent increases with no end in sight. And the MBR, which is a promise of greater economic security, will continue to remain elusive. I leave you with this. The majority of rent control tenants are senior citizens living on a fixed income, and their mean income is $28,000 per year. They have experienced the burden of up to 7.5% rent increases each year, along with fuel pass-alongs, and the unjust burden of higher MCI percentages at 15% for major capital improvement increases. Though the scree threshold has been lifted, which helps some of us, unfortunately, by the time that happened, most of us had already lost our quality of life. Thank you. Ah, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Abigail Martínez y vengo con el grupo Vecino Ayudando Vecinos. Me mudé al apartamento del 680-56 Street en Sunset Park en, en el 2014 con mi esposo, mis cuatro hijos, entre la edad de 2 y 11 años. Entré pagando $2,200 dólares de renta. Tenía ayuda con un compañero de, de cuarto y pagaba $1,200 dólares de renta. Cuando se fue el compañero de cuarto, perdí mi ayuda y fui a buscar ayuda con vecinos ayudando vecinos. Aprendí que mi apartamento era de renta estabilizada y que tengo derechos. Cuando recibe, revisé mi historial de renta, descubrí que el dueño 
reportó al Estado que yo estaba pagando 643,50 y el inquilino anterior pagaba 588,89. Aprendí que podría pedir una investigación con el Estado para determinar la renta legal. En octubre del 2017, el Estado encontró que el dueño me estaba cobra, sobrecargando la renta en la cantidad 54. 54 mil y mi renta, mi renta legal fue reducida de 2.200 a 588,89. Los propietarios se están aprovechando de los inquilinos, desconocen sus derechos. Si no estuvieran en un apartamento de renta estabilizada, no habría tenido la oportunidad de impugnar el monto del alquiler. Para para realmente hacer un cambio significante, debemos re revocar la desestabilización de vacantes que actúa como un incentivo para que los propietarios, como el mío, aumenten el legalmente alquiler más allá del umbral para consentir las unidades adqu adquiribles a la tasa mercadeo. Apoyo la resolución 188A y la introducción 600A. Quiero agradecer al portador Corey Johnson por ayudar al movimiento de los inquilinos a presionar Albany para que cierre las lagunas en las leyes de rentas estatales y municipales. Un por y por comprender que la mera renovación de las leyes de renta municipales en su, en su estado debilitado no es una respuesta adecuada a la asequibilidad, crisis que ahora estamos experimentando en los cinco condados. Quiero agradecer a mi concejal Carlos Menchaca por su apoyo a los inquilinos en Sonser Park. Gracias. Um, I'm going to be translating the testimonial. Um, my name is Abigail Martinez and I am with Neighbors Helping Neighbors. I moved into 680 53rd Street in Sunset Park in 2014 with my husband and my four children between the ages of 2 and 11 years old. My rent was $2,200 when I first moved in. I had help with a roommate who paid $1,100 toward rent. When my roommate left, I lost my supplemental rent and I looked for help. Neighbors, with Neighbors Helping Neighbors, I learned that my apartment was rent stabilized and that I have rights. When I reviewed my rent history, I discovered the landlord was reporting my rent as $643.50 and the prior tenant was only paying $588.89 for rent. I learned I could file a complaint with the state to determine the legal rent amount. And in October of 2017, the state determined that the landlord had overcharged me in the amount of $54,000 and ordered my legal rent rolled back from $2,200 to $588.89. Landlords are taking advantage of tenants who are unaware of their rights. If I were not in a rent-stabilized apartment, I would not have had the opportunity to challenge the legal rent amount. To truly make a difference, we must repeal vacancy destabilization, which acts as an incentive to, land to landlords, like mine, to illegally raise rent past the threshold to convert, convert affordable units to market rate. I support Resolution 188A and Intro 600A. I want to thank the Speaker, Corey Johnson, for helping the tenant movement apply pressure to Albany to try and close some of these loopholes in the state and city laws, and for understanding that merely renewing the city rent laws in their weakened state is not an adequate response to the affordability crisis we are now experiencing throughout the five boroughs. And I want to thank my Councilman, Carlos Menchaca, for his support of the tenants in Sunset Park. Okay, sorry. 
Hello? Okay, sorry, thank you. My name is Cynthia Chaffee, and I'm, and I'm a, um, a, the co-foundress of the Stop Chroman Coalition and also a member of GOALS. And we fully support Resolution 188A and Intro 600A. On behalf of the Stop Chroman Coalition, I am happy to be able to present testimony to the City Council, and we are especially thankful to Corey Johnson, the speaker, for his efforts and leadership to facilitate a campaign to put pressure on Albany to close the loopholes and weaknesses in the state and city rent laws that allow landlords to remove apartments from rent regulations and charge exorbitant rents that the working people of New York City cannot afford to live in. I believe that Corey Johnson fully understands that without the strengthening of the rent laws, we will, be, we will continue to lose rent-stabilized units to the point of extinction. Our, <coughs> excuse me, our landlord, Steve Croman, is a convicted felon and is currently save, serving one year in jail due to mortgage fraud. Also, a civil suit brought by the Attorney General's office on behalf of tenants who suffered extreme harassment was brought by attorney, the Attorney General's office and was recently settled. Under the terms of this settlement, he will have to relinquish the management of 106 of its properties to a new management company selected by the Attorney General. Steve Croman has an empire of close to 200 buildings in Manhattan. His modus operandi has been to acquire buildings and then begin to start the harassment of rent-stabilized tenants to get them out, raise rents, and deregulate apartments under the vacancy decontrol laws. He has been able to empty out most of the rent-regulated tenants out of all his buildings. Vacancy decontrol gives him an incentive to get tenants out using harassment techniques, tactics, excuse me, which, <coughs> which I'm sorry, I have my asthma today, um, which included frivolous litigation, deprivation of services, use of private agents known as tenant relocating, re relocation specialists to aggressively pursue buyout offers even when the agents were told by the tenants that they were not interested. One example is Raymond Minskel, He's an 85-year-old tenant and had lived in his rent-controlled apartment for 68 years. Croman bought the building and defrauded him of his succession rights, and thus his apartment was stolen from him. He's now living out his remaining years in a Salvation Army residence, which is also closing, and he will be uprooted again. Croman's victims are too numerous to mention. You may read more examples in our website www.stopcromancoalition.org. Go to the section called The Vulnerable. Vacancy decontrol has been the engine of displacement and gentrification in our neighborhoods. This incentive has to be eliminated together with the preferential rent loopholes and the statutory vac vacancy bonus, which gives the landlords 20% automatic rent increases upon a vacancy. The Stop Croman Coalition and I thank Corey Johnson for his leadership, and we call upon Mayor de Blasio to help mobilize the city to put pressure on Governor Cuomo to make this fight a priority. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. I'm gonna call the next panel. Barika Williams, Lino Diaz, Ellen Davidson. Exana Marinova.
Thank you all for joining us today. You can begin your testimonies when, uh, when you're ready. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on the vital importance of rent control and rent stabilization laws for New York City's tenants. My name is Oksana Miranova, and I'm a housing policy analyst at the Community Service Society, an independent nonprofit organization that addresses some of the most urgent problems facing low-income New Yorkers in their communities, including the effect of the city's chronic housing shortage. Rent control and rent stabilization are fundamentally a response to this chronic shortage, which creates a severe power imbalance between tenants and landlords. The primary purpose of the law is to prevent landlords from exploiting this imbalance to impose large rent increases and arbitrary evictions. This is a matter of simple justice, even before we consider the effects of rent regulation on affordability. This alone should be a sufficient reason for this committee, the city council, and the mayor to extend the laws as they're authorized to do under state law. Unfortunately, the affordability the rent laws provide fall short of what the city needs, partially as a result of specific loopholes within the law, vacancy deregulation, the vacancy bonus, and preferential rents. Beyond extending the laws, I hope that you will join tenants and advocates who will be seeking to strengthen the rent laws on the state level this year. While the rent laws are not an affordable housing program per se, they do help stabilize rental costs, which makes them more accessible to low-income people. The median household income in rent stabilized apartments was about $44,000 um, in 2016, as compared to $67,000 in unregulated units, a 40% difference. Importantly, the rent laws create a, me a mechanism to mitigate the immense pressure of the rental market on tenants. They allow the Rent Guidelines Board to, make economics the, to take into account the economic situation when they set uh, rent adjustments. With skyrocketing rent, the skyrocketing rental market in 2015 and 2016, uh, the RGB enacted two rent freezes. This had an impact. The median rent for rent-stabilized apartments rose from um, 1237 in 2014 to 1269, an increase of just 2.6% above inflation. In comparison, median rents in unregulated apartments rose from 1546 to 1700, or 10% above inflation. The two rent freezes have had a measurable impact on low-income New Yorkers. In 2017, as part of CSS's annual Unheard Third Survey, we asked low-income renters to rank how much of a problem afford affordable rent was um, to them. The share of the rent-regulated renters reporting a very serious or somewhat serious problem with affordability decreased by 13% um, from 2015 to 2017. In comparison, the share of unregulated renters reported a um, reporting a very to somewhat serious problem declined by only 2%. Um, as a broad-based um, as a broad-based program focusing on fairness rather than subsidy, rent regulation has an important place in our city's housing policy system. I urge you to pass the introduction and resolution in front of you today. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ellen Davidson. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society. Um, and I want to thank the Housing and Buildings Committee, the speaker, Johnson, uh, and particularly Chair Carnegie, who has uh, led this committee and remains here today with us. Um, uh, look, I mean, the real question for this committee is, is the vacancy rate under 5%? If so, as the law requires, uh, you must declare a housing emergency. I think the HVS has answered that question. It's 3.63%. Um, and uh, so I, I, so I I have, I have written testimony which goes on for 10 pages, which I am not going to go through. There are a couple of things I want on, to put on the record. Um, about last week, the Coalition for the Homeless put out a report on the state of homelessness, and one of the things they looked at was the most recent HVS, um, and they had this um, statistic which I found um, unbearably sad. Um, in 1999, there were 1.1 low-income households that needed um, affordable apartments renting for under $800. At the time, there were 1.35 million apartments which rented for under $800 a month. Today, uh, there are 867,000 households who need apartments that are renting for under $800 a month. Um, and according to the recently released HVS, there are now 
350,000 apartments renting for under $800. That is, in less than 20 years, we have lost a million apartments affordable to low-income New Yorkers. Um, you know, the law says that we need to have uh, the rent laws to prevent exactions of unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive rents and rental agreements, and to forestall profiteering speculation and other disruptive practices tending to produce threats to public health, safety, general welfare, and that in order to prevent uncertainty, hardship, and dislocation, the provisions of this act are necessary. Those words are as true today as they were in 1974. Um, and we ask uh, this council, this committee, and this council to um, enact and extend the rent laws. Thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon. My name is Barika Williams. I'm the deputy director at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Um, ANHD's mission is to advance equitable, flourishing neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. I want to say thank you first to you, Chair Cornegie, to the speaker, and to the committee for having us here to testify on this issue. Um, ANHD, as has been said by so many others, um, supports the resolution and the law before you um, and urges the council to pass uh, the local law and the resolution. Um, I won't, don't want to repeat what other folks have said, so I just want to hone in on a couple of things. Um, it has been suggested by some in the press that the dire affordability crisis in New York City is in some way lessening. Um, and while the housing vacancy rate has um, slightly increased. Um, interpreting that as affordability increasing across New York City would be a misreading of what the housing vacancy survey shows. Um, what we see is a continued tale of two cities. Um, there's a surplus of luxury high-cost housing that is largely unregulated um, and where rent burden is declining, but for the average New York City resident, the vast majority of our households in the city, there's a shrinking number of low-cost units, um, new market rate construction is out of reach, and the rent, rent burden is re worsening. Um, specifically, the vacancy rate in every single housing category, except for private unregulated stock, has been um, worsening. So all of the change that we see in the vacancy rate is attributed to the increase of private unregulated stock. In addition, um, what we do see also is that the, that the average New York City renter um, can only afford the average stabilized rent. They cannot afford the average private unregulated units rent. So the median income of a New York City resident is about $1,269, $1,300. Um, that um, translates into, sorry, is, um, is $47,000 in income. That translates into $1,200 in rent. Um, and there is a big gap between that and about the $1,700 that we see in the private market. Um, so again, I'd like to just say um, ANHD uh, urges the council to pass the two bills before you, um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good afternoon. My name is Lino Diaz. I'm a housing attorney at Legal Services New York City in the Queensboro office. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Rent regulation provides one of the few protections for New Yorkers in retaining and maintaining affordable housing. While the median asking rent for an apartment jumped 33.9% between 2014 and 2017, it only jumped by 2.6% in rent regulated units. For families with fixed incomes or jobs that fluctuate seasonally, this security is a key component to having a stable home. And a stable home provides everyone in the household with a number of intangible benefits. The ability for children to remain in their current school district without having to uproot. The ability for people of all ages to form community ties and take pride in their neighborhoods. And most importantly, the ability to feel safe and secure without market forces leaving people uncertain about where they'll lay their heads at night. Without an extension of rent stabilization protections, thousands of low income and working families would almost immediately be forced into the city's shelter system. I work in Queens a borough where there is a large percentage of unregulated housing and as a result, a large number of evictions based solely on the whims of landlords. Rent regulation ensures that tenants are able to remain in their homes as evictions are restricted to causes specified by law. 
Rent-stabilized tenants also have the right to lease renewals and succession rights for remaining family members, rights that ensure that affordable housing doesn't simply disappear as a result of market forces. These protections aren't hypothetical. I fought those battles and ensured that children retain the home that they've lived in all their lives and succeed in tenancies where their families have resided for multiple generations. I've argued against frivolous proceedings and ensured that people aren't evicted simply because the landlord is litigious. These protections are real, important, and necessary. I personally ensured that a senior citizen remained in her home where a landlord tried to evict her for allegedly always paying her rent late, retaining her housing and fighting off the unfair proceeding brought against her. By the same token, I've seen families enter the shelter system when evicted without cause from their unregulated housing. Because they've had no rent regulation protections, I've had to re represent people with newborns as well as parents of children with severe mental disabilities who were all evicted. I had the unfortunate luck of just litigating a case where a woman who has limited functionality of her hands and a severely mentally incapacitated son uh, was evicted by her landlord for no reason. The premises were not rent stabilized and her protections were non-existent. Now I have a bit more, but it's in the written statement. And for the time being, I'd just like to say that without the continued protection of rent stabilization, the situation would be far, far worse. We therefore thank the City Council for addressing this important issue and look forward to continuing our work helping the residents of New York City. Thank you for your testimony, and more importantly, thank you for the hard work that you do on behalf of all of the tenants who need advocacy and the hard work that you put in. I want to call the next panel, Delcenia Glover, Jose Luis Rodriguez, Scott Hutching, Ed Vieira, Jr., and Susan Steinberg. Excuse me. Thank you to those who stayed to testify. I know it's been a long day, but it's important to have your testimony, although uh, other members have other hearings that they've had to attend. Your, your, your testimony will be registered on the record uh, and, you know, in perpetuity. So thank you so much for, for staying, no matter what the volume of council members is. Okay, can I start? Should I start? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity su to submit testimony today. Uh, my name is Delcenia Glover, and I am the Director of Education and Organizing for New York State Tenants and Neighbors Information Service and New York State Tenants and Neighbors Coalition which are two affiliate uh, organizations that share a common mission, which is to build a powerful and unified statewide organization that empowers and educates tenants. Um, tenants, is in, tenants and Neighbors is testifying today in support of resolution number 188A and intro number 600A for the renewal of the rent stabilization and rent control laws, and I am here also to advocate along with the broad tenant and affordable housing movement for the strengthening of the rent laws. I would like to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for advocating for the strengthening of the rent laws and the chair of the Housing and Building Committee, Robert Cornegie, and all of the members of the Housing and Building Committee for agreeing to be allies in this essential fight for the soul and future of New York. The data that has been released in the Housing and Vacancy Survey outlines the severe housing crisis that low and moderate income tenants are facing in New York. In the past three years, the asking rent has risen by 30%. Rent burdens have grown, and the number of apartments renting for below $1,000 decreased by 87,720 units. This is the experience of our members and tenants across the city suffering because of a crisis of loss of affordability and weak rent laws. We are here today to also call on Albany to not just renew the rent laws, but strengthen them as well as fix a broken system. We are calling for the elimination of the vacancy bonus, vacancy, uh, what we call it the eviction bonus, 
reform preferential rents and major, major capital improvements and ensure that the rent laws serve the protection and stability of neighborhoods rather than promoting a fertile ground for speculative investment and tenant displacement. And uh, I, in support of Norma Schreier, one of our ten tenant members who spoke earlier, the rent control tenants residing in the remaining 22,000 uh, should be given at least a two-year rent freeze and get rid of the horrendous MBR system, and that is a message for Governor Cuomo. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Rodriguez, a member of Picture the Homeless. I would like to thank the Speaker Corey Johnson and the City Council for strengthening the rent laws. The Housing and Vacancy Survey has many New Yorkers concerned by the findings. 65 additional units are not available to, be, to, to rent. Me medium action rents increased 30% since 2014. Picture the homeless is asking the City Council to pass Intro 226, which, re which requires landlords to register their properties with the city. How can we address this homeless uh, crisis uh, without knowing avail available stock, empty buildings and lots? This bill will assist in housing many New Yorkers. Picture the homeless is asking the city council to support the re repealing the vacancy bonus and stop landlords from charging preferential rents. Since 1994, over 250,000 rent stabilized units have been lost through these practices. Repealing the bonus will help many New Yorkers stay out of shelters. Thank you. I would like to thank the speaker for inviting us to testify at this hearing and for the speakers and council's support for renewing and strengthening the rent laws protecting New York City tenants. My name is Scott Andrew Hutchins and I'm here to represent Picture the Homeless. In two months, I will, in two months, I will be a six-year resident of the New York City shelter system, which pays $1,306.91 per month more to shelters than the rent of my previous apartment to house me alone. At Picture the Homeless, we find the results of the survey appalling but not surprising. It reiterates our demand for a registry of all vacant property in the city as called for by Intro 226. The crux of our argument for this necessity is found in the following statistic from the report. Although the city increased its overall housing stock by 69,000 units this year, approximately 65,400 additional units are considered vacant but unavailable for sale or rent than in 2014. This means that net available housing stock for all practical purposes went up by only 3,600 units, far lower than the number of people who enter the shelter each year. While developers get tax breaks for creating new scare quote, affo scare quote affordable housing stock, the vast majority is well beyond the means of low and extremely low income people. The net vacancy rate for extremely low income housing is 1.15%, while the net vacancy rate for extremely high income units is 8.74%, and this is an upward trend. Whereas extremely low housing is on the decline, extremely low income housing is on the decline from the 2014 survey. With the median household income at $57,500, why are we giving tax breaks for housing for people who make over $100,000 per year when so many of these units are vacant? Instead, we should be doing the reverse. In addition to the fees and fines imposed by a vacant property registry, we support the introduction of a pied a terre tax for units that remain vacant for too much of the year. If the city is really committed to ending homelessness, it cannot be rewarding developers who add to the problem. Housing Committee Chair Carnegie, I want to thank you and the members of the Housing Committee uh, for supporting the renewal of city rent laws and the strengthening of state and city laws by closing loopholes. I'm Susan Steinberg. I'm president of the Stuyvesant Town Peter Cooper Village Tenants Association, and we support Resolution 188A and Intro 600A. 
Um, my community contains approximately 11,230 units and 28,000 residents. In 1947, it was built as a community for people of moderate means. In um, 1980, my one-bedroom apartment cost $250 a month. In 2018, that same one-bedroom apartment starts at $3,156. Figuring 30% of one's income for rent, one must earn $126,240 to afford that one bedroom. That's not moderate. New York City's average annual salary is $68,883, and our cost of living is 129% higher than the national average. So how did a rent-regulated community get from moderate to market? Through vacancy deregulation, the weakening of rent laws every time they come up for renewal in Albany, um, for vacancy bonuses, preferential rents, and lots of major capital improvements that we pay for in perpetuity. Loopholes that are bleeding our community, the city, and the state of regulated renters. To afford the rent in Stytown today, tenants double or triple up, and then they leave at renewal as rents rise. 2,000 units turn over every year, providing a really big opportunity for a 20% vacancy bonus. That plus multiple MCIs that we pay until death push rents to exceed the 2,700 per month deregulation benchmark. To ease the turnover burden and sting of market rates, managements offer preferential rents. 40% of our renters are preferential. And the difference between preferential and legal rents can be hundreds or thousands of dollars. Most renters don't understand that the landlord is allowed to raise the rent all the way up to the legal rent on renewal, and the Tenants Association gets the calls from tenants suffering from sticker shock when their monthly rent increases by, say, $500. Renters are at a disadvantage. Owners don't worry every three years about whether they'll have a roof over their heads. Resolution 188A and Intro 600A must be passed and rent law strengthened to ensure that housing for hundreds of thousands of tenants is a right, not a luxury. Thank you. Good afternoon. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I will. My name is Ed Vieira. I'm a disabled special ed teacher and a person living with AIDS for the past 30 years. I also support Resolution 188A as well as Introduction 600A. I, like everyone else, I wanna thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson and all the council members present. The fact is that the current city and state rent laws are weak, embedded within uh, loopholes that promote homelessness and economic misery among the disabled, the elderly, fixed and low-income people. Merely removing, uh, renewing these laws every few years perpetuates this crisis because the landlords are the ones who benefit the most from them. So we should, one, repeal the vacancy deregulation and re-regulate units lost to the control example. Uh, one of the tenants in my building uh, passed away two years ago. The landlords quickly moved to deregulate the apartment. The new tenant is now having to find somewhere else to live because she cannot afford the market rate. Two, repeal the preferential rent loophole that allows landlords to slam rent-stabilized tenants which, with huge rent increases when leases are renewed. This is where I come in. When my lease was renewed in 2016, my rent was increased from 1100 to 1250 uh, When the landlord, when I challenged the landlord, he told me that's what Hasa agreed to pay. That was a lie. That was a flat-out lie. So last year I went to housing court to fight the rent overcharge. It turns out that the housing court doesn't really handle that. They refer you to the HCR. So I filed with them last year, haven't heard anything from them. To speed up the process, I began withholding my 30% share of the rent in the hopes that the landlord files in housing court, and then I can counter for the rent overcharge, a fraudulent apartment registration designed to increase the market value, and harassment. 
As long as the landlord continues to hide behind the preferential rent loophole, my chances are dim, but I'm looking forward to the fight. Uh, last thing, repeal the statutory vacancy bonus. This means less housing for all of us and faster gentrification. So this is not just about me. This is about all of you, because I assume all of you are renting too. So it affects us all. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, we don't advocate the, the beating or harming of any horses or any other animals. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to call the last panel, Mr. Earl Carter, Ava Farkas, Jargel Rodriguez, Jessica Burke, and Ju Julie Horton. Side starts first. Yourself. Mm -hmm. You may begin. Thank you. If you could turn your microphone on and identify yourself. Thank you so. Thank you. Uh, certainly, last but not least, we hope. Uh, I appreciate the chance to be here. I'm Jessica Burke from RID, Residents in Distress the Christopher Street Partnership, and the 95 Christopher Street Tenants Committee. Uh, that being said, uh, I support these two bills and resolutions. I was asked to come here, and I wanted to state on the record, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going across the street, and I'm going to file a federal lawsuit against my landlord, BLDG Management. That would be Lloyd Goldman. Uh, from Goldman Goldman Di Lorenzo. Di Lorenzo was uh, involved in racketeering, and nothing much has changed in a number of years. Some of you might have read about my mom, who at nearly 90 was dragged out of my apartment, my two bedroom rent controlled penthouse apartment, at gunpoint, placed in a nursing home uh, under a whole variety of lies, and they had thought they had taken the apartment away from us. I, of course, um, maintained uh, the apartment. And I'd like to thank Arthur Schwartz, our district leader, who some of you may have read went to jail for removing the illegal surveillance cameras. And we've been in the news quite a lot lately. The landlord was forced by the judge to give us half a million dollars to vacate the apartment, which uh, I had a great deal of trouble accepting, accepting money from a crook, but I felt that the time to maintain residency in this rent control department was over because every day was a nightmare. I was constantly taken to the police precinct, falsely arrested, and the criminal acts perpetrated on myself and my mother for the last 40 years, I'm, I'm amazed I'm still alive. Mom is in a rehab center. She's 94, Ruth Burke. She's doing very well. And, but for the record, I'd like to know why my landlord is not in jail. Uh, Steve Crowman is not the only dirty landlord in the city. Uh, my landlord needs to go to jail. There's no accountability. Adult Protective Services, HPD, the 6th Precinct, Everybody accepts bribes and money from my landlord, building management, and they drag out rent uh, controlled tenants, rent stabilized tenants. Numerous elderly tenants who don't have any family or friends have been removed from my apartment. Some are homeless, they've been placed in shelters, and nothing's being done. There's no accountability. Um, and for the record, uh, anybody interested in starting a class action suit. Well, you can read about it in the paper. Uh, as I said, I'm going to uh, pursue litigation. But I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson for always being helpful as an advocate. Uh, my um, advocacy began with Tom Duane on the day he got elected. 
So I'm very happy that you're all still continuing the good work. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. My name is Julie Hanlon of the Dexter House, 345 West 86th Street. Uh, I'm a member of the Tenants Association. I'm also a member of an NGO representing um, in the United Nations that uh, work towards sustainable development goals for a law that was ratified recently in 2015 for 2030, part of which includes ending conditions of chronic poverty. Um, so one thing I want to start saying is that landlords bank on our ignorance, our poverty, or worse, our vulnerabilities in how they abuse these uh, regulatory laws. That is why I support the resolution 188-A and intro 600-A. So I want to thank um, Speaker Corey Johnson and uh, Honorable Chairman of this Council and the members of this Council for this privilege to speak to you about really um, something going on that is criminal through misuse of these loopholes in law. Uh, I also want to thank Honorable Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, who I guess she had to leave, but her advocacy in restoring affordable housing is tireless, and the people in her office, her staff, are impeccable in guiding tenants like me to a resolution and to keep the fight alive. I'm only four years into a battle. Um, so the loopholes that in regulation for what I live in, I live in an SRO landmark building built in 1924. So here are tenants that have very limited privileges. Federal laws prevent even private mail that lead to all kinds of problems. But let me focus on um, how the criminal harassment employed to force these people out of these meager little impoverished single rooms um, takes place. So for four years, they've been being poisoned slowly through chemical dispersions in the air not limited to pesticide poisons, mixed through uh, somebody brought up earlier, relocator aggressor people that managers hire. Our manager, Roberto Goicochea, we suspect is one of these people hiring people like that. He was found guilty by New York State DEC and Department of Environmental Protection and Department of Health for massive amounts of illegal banned pesticide poisons, illegal dispersions with illegally unlicensed people. I can't even get into the depth of fire potential risk, um, the, the, the heinous abuse it is to breathe air that you can't escape because it's there 24 hours a day in your home. So I, what I've done is I've put together a, a, the article that the New York Post, their investigative article, I stapled it with your my letter to this council. So the history of using these laws to, deregul to deregulate rooms like ours that is led by greed and cruelty is actually targeting the aging demographic of senior, disabled, um, elderly, mostly women. And that really disturbs me that it's mostly women because they are too weak to fight. I know five tenants that were females that died of cancer who all complained about fumes so strong that they feared for their life. Try proving a fume in housing court. It took me four years, but I did. Thank God for the HPD lawyers that stood up for me and the uh, lawyers, the inspectors involved that, you know, we're limited by agency hours nine to five. We can't really uh, get people in at night. So what we're left with as impoverished tenants um, in this demographic is, you know, these kinds of loopholes being prevented. And la laws should reflect penalties for landlords abusing tenants like this, and they should be forbidden to deregulate rooms. Uh, whoever can write that law, please do, when they're found guilty of harassment. My landlord's been proven and admitted their guilt in dispersing these chemicals. And you think it would stop there, but it hasn't. We're still breathing poisonous fumes up to 24 hours a day in our rooms. And what it looks like for the SRO tenants on the ground is that um, we're, we live in fear of speaking out, serving our rights. I've got a death threat. I know three other women that have a death threat. No protection because law enforcement can't get involved relegating this to a housing issue. 
This is reduced to a housing issue, criminal harassment. So the, there's predatory landlords like ours who use criminal harassment in these loopholes that have zero regard for the rent-stabilized tenants, and they use every means to extract us out of our right to live peacefully and with security. So without these laws repealed, we are at war just to keep it in our home. So, you know, I'm a witness to tenants that they, they let rent for 29 days on the 30th day, as an example of a loophole abuse by our building. They, they come for 29 days and then boom, they're, they're, they, they've made an agreement to leave by the 30th day. The rent goes up again. Can you please you bring your testimony 20%. to a close for us? Pardon? Can you just bring your testimony to a close, please? Yes, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Sorry. It's, uh, it's a complicated issue that these loopholes enable predatorial landlords using criminal harassment against elderly, aging people. And I believe that repealing these, these laws and the vacancy loophole will protect further our right to prosecute, because I have to prosecute now. I mean, it's become very serious. We're going to die if we don't stop the fumes. And His Honor Judge Went just restored my case for chemical abuse. So, hey, thank you for thank your you. testimony. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Cornegie. Thank you to all the council members who are still in the room. Um, we really appreciate um, having this issue be paid uh, close attention to and given importance. Um, my name is Ava Fargus. I'm the executive director of the Met Council on Housing. We're the city's oldest tenant union. We represent rent stabilized and rent controlled tenants across the city, and we offer anti eviction services through our hotline and our clinics. And um, I worked briefly in the city council before my current position, so I understand and know how much you hear about housing from your constituents and what a daily issue and urgent issue it is. Um, and I just want to emphasize the importance of the bully pulpit you all have to help uh, push the issues of closing the loopholes, strengthening the rent laws in Albany. We've worked together in the past, in 2015 during the rent law expiration. Many council members went up to Albany and got arrested and did direct action with us, with the tenant movement, and we really appreciate that and we look forward to, to being in the struggle together. Um, I wanted to just use the opportunity today to just talk not just about passing the resolutions, but to also talk about taking action on a housing issue that you have direct control over, which is the city's rezonings. Um, today on the cover of AM New York is an article about the inward rezoning. It's something that Med Council on Housing has been working on very closely. And as we heard here today, and we heard from many of the testimonies, the greatest need is in the lowest income bands. Uh, that's where the, there's the lowest vacancy, whereas higher rent apartments have a higher vacancy rate. And yet the city's solution to the affordability crisis is the mandatory inclusionary housing program and the rezonings, which are going to create buildings that are majority market rate and are not meeting the need that we just heard expressed over and over in this hearing today. And what's more, there's really no analysis of the impact on rent regulated units in the surrounding area. And it's really dangerous, I think, for the city to pursue housing development without taking into account the impact it will have on our current stock of affordable housing and rent regulation. So they only study in the environmental review non-regulated units as being potentially um, housing that could be displaced, but there's no study in the environmental reviews for rent regulated housing. And in Inwood, there are over 6,000 households with preferential rent. And that means that those rents could skyrocket as soon as the rezoning goes through and as soon as speculation heats up in the neighborhood. And that jump can be hundreds of dollars. So we are really sitting on like a potential crisis and the fact that there's no information, the city doesn't have to study this or look into displacement is really troubling. And so I really urge you not just to pass the bills today, but to also hold the city to a higher standard when it comes to the creation of new housing and really, really fight for that new housing to be deeply, deeply affordable. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jorge Rodriguez. 
I live in Corona, Queens, New York, in City Council District 21 and New York State Senate District 13. Um, right now I'm in discussion with a uh, neighbor who is presently thinking of moving due to preferential rent. He is considering moving to another state. This tenant rented an apartment in 2015 after his first two-year lease, his rent increased by $129. After a year, his second lease had been increased by $109. His monthly rent is constantly being increased due to the many MCIs. He, in his initial rent um, of $1,250 is now over $1,500. He cannot afford another increase. He applied for disability rent increase exemption, known as JRI, and was denied because his permanent legal regulated rent is $2,337, so he can't get it. If this tenant moves out, the landlord can then apply the vacancy bonus of 20%, and the next tenant will be paying more. Once the rent reaches 2,700, as you all know, it will no longer be protected by the rent stabilized and rent guideline board's rules. Eventually, these apartments will no longer be affordable to many New Yorkers. Other tenants I've seen moving out from the complex have complained about preferential rent. It appears that it's not explained when a lease is initially signed. Most did not know that their rent would increase drastically year to year. They only get one year lease. They were under the impression that the increase would be those determined by the RGB. They also had no idea that they would be responsible for MCIs. As an example, in the past year, my rent has increased by $99.83 due to MCIs. Luckily, I have SCREE. The amount would be higher had I not convinced the vision of housing and community renewal, the HCR, that my apartment is really three rooms, not four. For all these years in my apartment, I've been paying MCIs based on four rooms, not three. And I won't get that money back, by the way. Okay. Um, the income increase allowed by SCREE and DREE, great programs. Legal representation and housing for individuals being evicted is welcome. But the only way we can keep rent affordable is we have to change the MCI, the preferential rent, the bonus book, the vacancy bonus and the vacancy decontrol laws. I am hoping you all can help us. While MCIs are to our rent are added to our rent, tenants continue comp continue to complain in the complex where I live, by the way, it's Left Rock City, a lack of heat services, etc. In a recent canvassing I did in a building to get people more involved with all these changes in the laws, most of them said they could not get involved. When I asked them why, is they felt that the information I was compiling would then be turned over to the landlord and be used against them. So though they spoke to me, and they complained about everything going in, in the complex, they did not want to get involved. Okay, so again, we need to do something about these laws, and I'm hoping that the uh, city council can help us. So thanks for letting me speak. Thank you so much for your testimonies, yeah. all of you. Thank you. For the record, we have a testimony submitted by RSA by CHIP and by the Public Advocates Office. Now we'll proceed to a vote. We ask Billy Martin to call the roll. William Martin, Committee, committee Clerk, Roll Call Vote Committee on Housing and Buildings, Introduction 600A in Resolution 188A, Chair Cornegie. I vote aye. Cabrera. Aye. Chin. Aye. Gordenchik. Aye. Jonai. Aye. Rivera. Aye. 
I have a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Both items have been adopted by the committee. We'll keep the roll open for 15 minutes. We have to. Uh, Continuation roll call committee on housing and buildings. Councilmember Rosenthal. I vote aye. Thank you. 